A few months back, one of the best astrophotographers in the world gave a talk at my local planetarium. And this guy knows his stuff. He's won the International Photography Award for Best Astrophoto both in 2022 and in 2023. And he had his picture shared by NASA themselves. And I was lucky enough to get an interview. Hello, my name is Jacob. Uh, I'm an astrophotographer. Uh, I've been doing it for 12 years. I had this weird idea that astrophotography was way out of my league and it was something that only NASA and other big corporations were able to do. I started taking pictures with my mobile phone. Every time I took a picture with my mobile phone, I saw that I could do it a little bit better and a little bit better. And then I noticed that when I showed people what I was taking pictures of, then it hit them the way it hit me when I saw it. And then I said to myself, okay, I need to do more of this and I need to get way, way better at this. This is my basic setup. This ba basic. is, yeah, <laughs> for me, this is the basic setup. There's my small refractor mounted. When it's doing deep sky, then this setup is mounted on the telescope along so, with. So your entire setup, oh, okay. So your entire finder scope. Yeah, is this the, the, the computer? Everything is just on a dovetail on its on its own. Yeah, so I can take this off, you know, as easily as just loosening these two, then take it off. Yeah. Just unplug the camera, and then I can transfer this to my other scope. Yeah. And this is the entire telescope setup, uh, the entire control setup that controls everything from out of focus to finding the objects on the sky and, and so on, guiding and everything. So it's where really, you, really easy. Where do you get the autofocus? Oh, right, 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 right. right. Yeah. yeah, this one doesn't have autofocus. No, okay. Uh, but the autofocus is mounted on my large Newtonian. Camera, what kind of camera are you using? Yeah, this is a ZWO uh, 1600 and it's a black and white, so it's called ZWO MM Pro. And this one is a four thirds sensor. Yeah. Which means you have an almost square image. Yeah. And this is not, it's not necessarily the best astral camera anymore. When I bought it, it was the best, right? But that's development for you. Yeah, that's just tech. Yeah. Um, but this is monochrome and that means that I have to shoot through a filter wheel. And inside this filter wheel, which is motorized, there are seven filters. So there's a luminance filter, which is basically just a clear piece of glass. Mm -hmm. Then there's an R, G and a B filter for making color images. Mm -hmm. And then there are the narrowband filters. There's H-alpha, there's S2 and oxygen. The first scope was like a very, very small refractor where the optics were okay, like if you were a child, but the mount itself was horrific. So if you just breathe on the telescope, the image would like bounce around like this and you couldn't see anything. Then I sort of lost interest in it because I thought it was way too difficult. But then I got this other motorized scope, not very big, but it had a mount that was motorized and the mount was stable enough so that even if you were focusing and even if you were like touching the telescope, the image would stay still. When you go out for a shoot, is it more of an like opportunity what's available or do you plan in advance say here, I really want to shoot this target and, and then, then plan? How do, you, how do you plan a shoot before you go out? So deep sky is always planned way ahead and I usually plan more than half a year ahead. So you kind of have a calendar where you say, okay, in the month of, uh, of, of, of September, um, I want to shoot these targets when, when available because I know they're going to be up and gonna have enough altitude so that I don't have to shoot through yeah. too much atmosphere, that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Okay. But if it's nightscapes, then I have multiple locations that are good for looking in specific directions according to where the Milky Way is. My nightscapes always include the Milky Way and I always try to find new ways to make it interesting because while the Milky Way is a spectacular sight in and of, it, of itself, it gets old really quickly if you're only looking at that because it doesn't change. But if you change the nightscape, the location of the nightscape, then it changes. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I always have multiple locations planned for then if the weather is bad in one spot, then I can drive maybe 100 kilometers to another spot 
and then I know where I have a location that I can point my camera in the specific direction of where the Milky Way will be positioned. I wouldn't say I have a commitment, but I have like a, a rule that I refuse to use light pollution filters. Okay. I want to shoot it as natural as I can shoot it. And then so, I... So no H alpha band filters, no, nothing like that at all? Just... Not, not for my nightscapes. No, okay. Of course, for my deep sky, I use H alpha and so on. Mm -hmm. But for my nightscapes, I want to keep it just as in camera as I can. And that means going to a light polluted location like on the outskirts of Copenhagen is a huge challenge. But I like that challenge and I like the way it challenges me to use my camera in the best possible way to get what I want. This is what I use for making nightscapes. First off, of course, the business end is the camera. And the camera here is just a normal Nikon D5500, but with a small twist because it's astro modded. And that means that the front filter in here has been removed from the sensor. Did you mod it yourself or? Did no. No, okay, you uh, had a professional shop doing it. Yeah. Astro shop. While because... I'm still a technical person and I'm not scared of put tearing anything apart, uh, I'm still not the kind of person that buys a camera for a many thousand Danish kroner and then tears it apart, right? Yeah. I wanted it done pre-hand. Then coupled with that, I use a Samyang 24mm lens. And while I do know that there are many, many lenses that are better than the Samyang, the reason I bought this is because it was cheap and I was on a budget at the time. Mm -hmm. And the Samyang lens, while still being cheap, is near perfect coma corrected. Then it sits mounted on the motor and this is an Ioptron sky tracker and the Ioptron comes in a few different variants and for me this is the best tracker hands down you can get because it's simple it's just powered by an internal battery that you can charge. So you just charge and it down the side. Yeah. yeah and this battery um, I don't know how long the life of the battery is, but I've been using this one for 10 years. Hopefully charging it some, at some oh, time. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> charging it at some time, but I mean, I go maybe uh, 10 nights between charging it. Yeah. It's not necessary. You have a small polar scope sitting here at the end, and that means that when you first point your mount loosely at Polaris, mm -hmm then you can put a laser pointer down here along the side yeah and then this laser pointer when you align the laser pointer light to polarize using this where you turn this from whichever side you need to turn it yeah then you use a small polar scope to make your fine adjustments what would you say like the proudest moment has been in in your astrophotography career most definitely when i shot the iss in front of the sun it's this one uh, where the ISS is, it's actually just a small black blob, but you can clearly see when you look close at it, you can clearly see the solar panels and you can see the main body of the ISS. When I got that image shared on APOD is, you know, the hugest honor, right? Mm. Um, and then Danish news took up this image because I got it shared on APOD and then my Facebook feed, my Instagram feed just crashed because I got so much attention, right? So of all the pictures you've taken, which one would you say is, uh, is your favorite and, and why? The one behind here. This image shows me standing uh, at the top of Taide, uh, which is a volcano in Spain on Tenerife. And it's taken at four o'clock in the morning. It was bitterly cold. I was freezing, my teeth were clattering together can't see the image because I'm good at standing still, but this is hands down my best image ever because it takes everything that I like about astrophotography. It shows the landscape, it has some drama, but it also shows how insignificant we people are. It shows how small we are against the enormity of the Milky Way. So I know you have your, uh, your Newtonian and you, uh, we mentioned, we talked about that uh, prior to me coming here. It's a rather special, special yeah. Newtonian that you don't, they don't make those anymore. No, I can show it. Yeah, let's go and pick it up. Even though it's made of carbon, it's heavy. It's like really, really heavy. 
Is that like an eight inch? This is a 10 inch. 10 inch, okay, yeah. wow. Here, I have a coma corrector. And now if you notice how large this coma corrector is. Jesus. This is the entire coma corrector, right? Yeah. And this coma corrector is made specifically for this telescope. Okay, yeah, so that's an additional add-on. Yeah. Yeah. And this one is an absolute must because it's almost impossible to get the scope in focus uh, with any camera unless you have this specific coma corrector. Okay. And the coma is bad when you're not using it. And then this wire is because the telescope, uh, the secondary mirror is heated. Mm. Because although this telescope has a reputation for for keeping dew away, mostly, yeah. here in Denmark, forget about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So here in Denmark, you definitely need to have a, a heater for the secondary scope because otherwise, within half an hour, you're not imaging anymore. No. Right. And then. So it's one of those like stick on the back kind of deals. Yeah. And then you just yeah, you just route it around the yeah. Uh, yeah. And then of course, do it as carefully as you can so this doesn't make any weird diffraction patterns, right? Mm -hmm. And then if you see in here, you can see these rings yeah, that like align. A, like a baffle or something? Yeah, contrast baffles. And they also make a huge difference compared to other Newtonians. It's a huge mirror. The secondary mirror is, is huge, right? Yeah. But this means that you can go basically full frame and not have any issues. Yeah. Because also the... Um, the focuser is two inch, right? Yeah. So you can basically take any full frame camera and just plug it right in and you won't get any serious vignetting. No, no. Um, of course, at the moment, I and use if a you four put thirds. A, if you put a four third on it, then you, yeah. are, you have like, you don't get image. any any vignetting at all. No, not at all. Why did they stop making these? I have no idea. I mean, it's, it seems like, uh, like like the, the the end dream scope for for most like serious yeah. astrophotographers. Yeah. So, of course. I mean, and, and Skywatch is very much still in business. Oh yeah, yeah. So I, it seems like a weird choice. But I have no idea that you why you can't buy it anymore. So what would you say has been the most like technically challenged? We talked about the um, the uh, nightscape and close to Copenhagen to deal with light pollution. Would you say that's the most technical challenging picture you've taken, or is there another one that you find really hard to shoot? If we just talk a challenge in terms of patience, that would be the Spaghetti Nebula. Because yes. the Spaghetti Nebula is huge, right? And I shot it with my 135mm Samyang lens, because that can encompass the whole nebula. But even when exposing for 20 minutes per frame, I could barely see it. Yeah. I could barely see it, and I was like, this is impossible. I'm, I'm never going to shoot this nebula, but I persisted and I continued shooting for almost eight months in a row. Just shooting and shooting and shooting and shooting and shooting until I finally got what amounted to about 40 hours of exposure. And that's also a huge gamble spending so much time yeah. on something where, I mean, you could have ended up in a situation where it's just a bit unusable and you just have to like yeah. throw in a towel at the end. Yeah, exactly. Because it's, it's such a faint object. Yeah. Yeah. So um, if there are people out there who, uh, who want to get started with astrophotography, what kind of equipment would you recommend? Where should people start? You need to make a choice. You need to decide how much time are you willing to dedicate to this because time is, uh, I know it sounds corny, but time is of the essence because whether you make nightscapes or you make deep sky or just look at the moon, it's a seriously time consuming hobby. If you like landscapes and if you like, you know, wide panoramas and so on, and you don't necessarily want to be a huge nerd from the get go. You just want to try out, you want to experiment. Then I would recommend going into nightscapes because most cameras today are so advanced that you don't for starters, need a tracker. You can just go out, pick a spot and expose, click, and then you get the Milky Way. If you want to go into deep sky, right? If, if you want to take pictures from your backyard and you're just starting out, I would definitely recommend that you get a refractor that's wide field, like 350, 400, 500 millimeters, sort of in that ball game. Because when you buy a refractor, it's maintenance free, right? You just buy it, 
you put it out, take it out of the box and you use it. And then you put it down and you don't need to make all sorts of adjustments. You don't need to learn how to collimate lenses and all this. What about more like proficient astrophotographers? Like, let's say people already started, maybe they already have their first goal. They had a bit of success, they've taken their first few images. Are there any like gear or equipment where you really feel like, hey, when I got that, that really elevated my, my actual photography game? There's a gadget called Asi Air from uh, Setup VO, which is basically a small uh, Raspberry Pi computer. Then the minute I start Asi Air up and say, let's do a polar alignment, then it takes an image of Polaris. And then when it's, it's taken the image, then it rotates the scope about 60 degrees like so. Mm -hmm. And then it continuously takes a picture. And then by rotating like this and taking the picture, it can see how much out of alignment am I. And then all I need to do is take my mobile phone, I put it here, and then I, I ask it to do what's called continuous uh, reading, right? And then every time I adjust just a little bit here, then it gets a correction reading here. Am I farther away from where I want to be or am I closer to where uh, I want to be? Would be a good point to talk about your post-processing workflow. Um, like what kind of softwares do you prefer to use and how long do you usually spend um, after you come home uh, to process a single image? If it's a deep sky image, then the post-processing is relatively straightforward. I use a program called PixInsight. There I use a script that's called auto-integrate because the script auto-integrate does all the lazy work, which means that I only have to feed the script my light images, my flats, my darks, and so on. And then when I feed the script these files and tell it what I want, then it stacks the image for me. And then I get a base image where all the different channels are stacked. And then I usually do this where I separate the stars from the nebulae because then I can process the nebulae by itself without burning out the stars. And then I put the stars on top of the nebulae afterwards. And this process can take anywhere from five to 10 to 20 hours. If it's a nightscape, it's a whole different ball game. Most of my nightscapes are huge panoramas because my camera is an APS-C sensor. I use this because with the crop factor, I can avoid some of the coma that the lens produces. But this also means in turn that if I need to make a huge panorama of the Milky Way with the landscape in turn, then most of my nightscapes are 40, 50, 60 images that need to be stitched together. For this, I use a program called Microsoft Ice, which is a panoramic program that's free. Yeah. And it's one of the best, uh, coincidentally, and it's free. When I've made my panoramic image of the foreground and then subsequently my panoramic image of the sky, then I take these two images, put them into Photoshop. And then when I've put them into Photoshop, I blend them together so that the Milky Way falls naturally in line with the way it looks on the foreground. But on the foreground, of course, the sky is smeared because it's not tracked. But you can still see where the Milky Way is supposed to be positioned. If you want to see more of Jacob's photos, I'm going to be linking both his homepage as well as his Instagram profile in the description. Go and check it out. Trust me, there are some amazing pictures over there. Oh, look at this. Now we get a proper view of it. We're in top three and we're starting with Telescopius. This is a web page and it is amazing. 